All right, everybody, fourth unit, home stretch. Uh, hopefully you've been doing really well so far. And if you're not, well, I hope you're giving me emails and letting me know so I can do what I can to try to help you out. I just wanted to point out that this fourth unit here, let me make this a little bit bigger so everybody can see what we're talking about. Um, what we're doing now with the fourth unit is talking about um, personal risks. So we already dealt with personal property risk and personal liability risk. Your biggest liability risk is from your auto. And that was in the immediately preceding unit. Um, yeah, you might have some liability risk from being a property owner um, and from your actions on other properties. We talked about homeowners and renters insurance, how you can have some liability coverage there. Um, your property risks, we talked about how to cover those in homeowners and, and renters. And then also in auto, when we're talking about physical damage, what if you damage your car and you can't sue anybody? It's nobody else's fault but your own. Um, or it's an other than collision loss. Somebody steals your car, hail damage wrecks your car. That's property risk. We talked about how to ensure that already. Now we've got to talk about these remaining personal risks. We've got the risk of premature death. That's got a very specific economic definition that we'll talk about in just a second. And life insurance is the tool that we use to handle that possibility. We're worried about, all right, if something happens to me, financially, that's a problem for anybody who relies on my income. And that's what life insurance is intended to do, is to replace my lost income. That's the, the biggest use of life insurance. There's others, and we'll talk about those. When I retire, how do I know that I have enough assets set aside to live on? Well, I, I really don't, unless I know for sure how long I'm going to live. Uh, that's always going to be an unknown. And because of that, that makes it a little tricky to manage. We do have a tool to handle that called an annuity. We'll talk about a life annuity and how that works in this unit. Um, the example I always use for poor health is an appendectomy, right? It's completely random and unpredictable. It's not linked to behavior. So you can't say that, well, uh, you know, all I have to do is behave properly and then I won't have any health expenses. Um, that's a naive way of thinking. That's a, that's a way of thinking that shows that you've been lucky so far. And hey, that's great. I hope that continues. Um, but there's all kinds of things that can wreck your health that are not predictable, that are not attributable to anything that you did, um, that are completely random. But they can have huge financial impacts because of how expensive the U.S. healthcare system is. So the risk of poor health is something that could bankrupt you if you're not careful. We need to talk about that. And that's why I think it's an opinion, but I think every American does need catastrophic health insurance. Um, to prevent that possibility of being financially wiped out from an unpredictable health risk. Risk of unemployment. You say, hey, I'm just going to work really hard. I'll be a good worker, and then I don't have to worry about losing my job. That'll work until they lay off the whole division. And then at that point, um, it does. it's not about talent. It's not about ability. It's not about how hard you work. Uh, everybody loses their job. So we all face this risk of losing our job through no fault of our own. Um, and we find out that's not a privately insurable risk. So if you want to do something about that, um, it really does have to be a public program, has to be a government program, because the private sector isn't going to be able to help you with that. We do have unemployment insurance, and we'll talk about some of those social insurance pro programs towards the end of this unit. But for the beginning, I want to talk about life insurance. Um, and then this is kind of an outline for where we're going. We'll talk about life insurance. Then we'll talk about life annuities. Remember, annuities are just a stream of payments. There's nothing special about an annuity. It's just a series of payments. Um, when it continues for your, the duration of your life, we call it a life annuity. That's probably a new concept for most people in here. Most of the time, if you've dealt with annuities, it's been pricing them along the lines of, well, I want to get a 30-year mortgage on a house that costs $150,000. Um, at four and a half percent, how much is my monthly payment going to be? Yeah, that's a 30 year payment stream. That's an annuity problem. Um, and we can handle that with time value of money techniques. Life annuities are a little bit trickier because we don't know how long somebody's going to live. We've got to insert a probability function to estimate the duration of the payments. Um, so we're not going to handle the math part of it in here. I just want to explain how that works and how you can use that to create an income that you cannot outlive. And that's the real value of a life annuity for us when we're thinking about this. Then we'll talk about health insurance. Um, what happens if my income is interrupted permanently? Well, life insurance, we've got that. What if my income is interrupted temporarily? With disability insurance, uh, that's a tool that is 
going to help us in that situation. And then we've got social insurance programs. I will talk about helping people uh, save for their retirement years through Social Security. We'll talk about Medicare as a way to help people in their retirement years deal with expensive health care prospects. Um, then we'll talk about unemployment insurance and we'll talk about workers' compensation. Those are our four big social insurance programs that we have in the U.S. So that's a pretty good outline for where we're going. Um, I wanted to go ahead. Let me adjust this uh, just a little bit see if I can get my window to be bigger where I need there. Look at that. Okay, let's drag that up. That should be okay. Um, then we'll go ahead and talk about chapter 11, which is life insurance. We've got to define this idea of premature death. And we'll talk about how it impacts different families in different ways uh, based on the structure. Really, it's a simple idea. It comes down to how many dependents were relying on that person's income. The more dependents, the bigger a problem it's going to be if you lose that income, whether that's through premature death whether that's through disability or whether that's through unemployment. It's the same problem. The only thing that's different is the duration, right? If I'm disabled, I'm hoping I'm going to eventually heal and get back to work. Most disability does resolve that way. Some doesn't. Permanent disability is the same problem as premature death, except that you also have additional medical expenses. Um, we'll talk about that when we talk about disability. So talking about premature death, it affects different families different ways because of how many dependents you have, how many people were relying on that person's income. We've got two different ways to estimate how much life insurance you need. Uh, that's the human life value approach and the needs approach. And then we have uh, two different types of life insurance. And because of that, they're priced in two different ways. So as a preview, there's only two kinds of life insurance. There's a whole bunch of subtypes, and that's where people get confused. But there's really only two types of life insurance. Either it covers you for your whole life, the rest of your life, and you pay premiums until your life ends. That's permanent life insurance. That's whole life insurance. Same thing. Or it lasts for only a specific period of time, 20 years. And if you survive 20 years, then that's the end of the contract. That's called term insurance. So we have term insurance and permanent insurance. Those are the only two types of life insurance we have. There's a bunch of different ways we can further subdivide and we'll talk about those. Um, but that's, it's really only two types of life insurance. And because of that, we got two different ways to pay for it. A yearly renewable term, and then we've got a level premium method where you're paying the same amount each year. Um, your mortality risk is increasing each year. So because of that, uh, you should expect that your premiums are going to go up each year. Uh, the other way to do it is to overpay in the early years so that you can level that off, underpay in the late years. Um, that's the level premium method. We'll talk more about that as we go. Okay, so this idea of premature death, it's an economic concept. It means death with outstanding, unfulfilled financial obligations. It's not a function of age. Uh, it's a function of do people rely on your income? If they do and it ends, that creates a problem. If nobody relies on your income, then financially that doesn't create a problem. Um, and that's what we're talking about, where you have people who rely on your income, that's something that's got to be protected. If you're single, you have no dependents, then probably right now you don't have much of a life insurance need. It's okay. Um, my goal isn't to get people to go out and buy life insurance, especially if you don't have dependents. You, that's probably not the best use of your money right now if you don't. If you do have dependents who rely on your income, this is a critical, critical thing. Um, and I, I hope if you do that you've already taken steps to, to take care of that. The good news is it's not difficult and it's typically not terribly expensive. We'll get to explore that in our life quote assignment that you'll do. So what happens when somebody dies with outstanding unfulfilled financial obligations? Well, the biggest cost you have is the loss of earnings to the family. Um, and that's going to result in a drop in the standard of living. Um, there will be final expenses, and these will surprise you if you haven't gone through this. Um, the final expenses of a funeral and a burial, um, I used to think, well, the reason it's expensive is because it's coming at a bad time. It's unexpected. You didn't have time to shop around. Um, that's not really what it is. Um, there really isn't a way uh, to reduce final expenses. It's just... Um, a process that's expensive. There's not a whole lot you can do to reduce some of these costs. And in general, it's not something that can be handled by people out of pocket. Um, a $10,000 funeral is not an expensive final cost uh, summation. Um, it, it just isn't. 
So uh, this isn't really an area where you can hope that people being wiser in the way they spend money will really cut down on how much they have to pay. That's not really the case. Um, and then we have non-economic costs too. Uh, when you talk about loss and grief, those are real things. Um, they affect people and they result in negative consequences. And there really aren't financial ways to solve that problem. So premature death creates problems. The financial ones we can solve with life insurance. The non-economic costs that we deal with, life insurance doesn't help us with. And that's just an important thing to recognize. So economic justification of life insurance, fancy title, simple idea. Uh, the idea is people relied on my income and if I'm gone, that creates a problem. Life insurance is always a valued policy. And if you think about it for just a second, that makes sense. We can't use replacement cost, actual cash value, depreciation. Those terms don't mean anything when we're talking about life insurance. So the way it works is you buy a fixed amount ahead of time. Everybody agrees this is how much gonna, is going to be paid out in the event of loss. We don't have any partial losses. It's all total losses here. So the full amount will be paid out in the event of loss, and we agree ahead of time how much that's going to be. Maybe that's $50,000, maybe it's $100,000, maybe it's a million dollars. Million dollars sounds like a lot of money, and it is, uh, but when you're thinking about the loss of your income for the rest of your life, at a young age, a million dollars is not a lot of life insurance coverage. Most of you will earn a lot more than a million dollars over your working lifetime. Um, so when the numbers get a lot bigger, when you start talking about, I need to protect my income for my family for what would have been the rest of my life, and that's going to be expensive. So what you're really insuring against is uncertainty about the time of death, not whether or not you're going to die, but the time when that's going to happen. Um, and it's going to be different for different types of families. We've got a few different types of families that are talked about in the textbook that I can briefly touch on here on the next slide. Um, when we're talking about the need for life insurance and how that changes. Okay, so different types of families that we're talking about here. Uh, people who are single. Single people typically have no financial dependence, and because of that, they typically don't have much of a need for life insurance. Um, maybe if you're really planning, you want to be thinking about final expenses and having a little bit of coverage for that, but you don't have the big source of uh, income reliance that usually drives coverage. You, namely, you don't have people relying on your income that now has to be provided for what would have been the rest of your life. Uh, if you're a single person, no dependence, you really don't have uh, a life insurance need at this time. Um, and that's, uh, that's about the only group that doesn't have a life insurance need. When you switch it to single parent families, the need is pretty serious. Um, here we're talking about a family with children, one worker in the household. The children are pretty heavily reliant on that worker's income. And the life insurance need here is uh, pretty clear. Two income families, uh, and this is uh, more uh, norm what you see uh, today. I wanna uh, just take a second to talk about that. What the textbook defines as a traditional family is one parent in the workforce and the other not uh, taking care of household chores and uh, children. Uh, that's traditional in the textbook author's eyes. It's probably more traditional today. We have more families with two income workers. Um, so you've got more families where both parents are working and they have children. In that situation, yeah, then there is a life insurance need, uh, probably on both income earners, uh, because presumably the reason that both parents are working is because the family needs income from two people to survive. If that's the case, then we have a life insurance need on each of the parents. Um, in a traditional family where you've only got one parent in the workforce, it's easy to see that, yeah, there's a life insurance need on that parent. There's a life insurance need on the other parent too, though. Uh, they're taking care of household tasks. They're taking care of children. If we lose them, we're gonna have to pay somebody to perform those tasks and it's not gonna be cheap. Um, so it's important not to underestimate the life insurance need for the stay-at-home parent. Um, that can be a fairly significant need too. Blended families, that's where you've got two parents with children coming together to form a new family. What usually happens is you've got more children, more dependents, and therefore you've got a higher life insurance need. Um, it's hard to say specifically without talking about exactly how many children 
Um, so it's hard to compare among these families whose need is going to be the highest. About all you can say is, yeah, there's a life insurance need except for single people. And then we're starting to see more and more instances of what we call sandwiched families, where you've got one generation taking care of children, then they're also taking care of parents that have moved in. Um, so they are sandwiched between an older generation and a younger generation. Uh, again, same issue. Uh, the number of dependents has increased, and therefore the amount of life insurance that's necessary has probably increased as well. So all of these families, yeah, there's a life insurance need unless you're a single person, no dependents. Um, so we're just kind of underscoring what's a relatively simple idea that we've talked about so far. Okay, so there's a couple of different ways you can go about approaching how much life insurance should you buy. We've got the human life value approach, and then we've got the needs approach. So the human life value approach, the first thing that's going to happen is we're, what we're doing here. This is a time value of money estimation. We're going to calculate the present value of your future earnings. Okay, so what is that? Well, what are your current earnings? We'll start there. And then we'll figure out how much of that is actually going to support me, right? So taxes are going to change if you lose my income. Uh, if I die, I don't have to pay my life insurance premiums anymore, so we can subtract that out of expenses. And then the big one is going to be cost of self-maintenance. So if I die, certain expenses go away entirely, right? The big one is probably going to be a second vehicle. So my family still needs, we're probably not excited about moving houses, uh, so the mortgage isn't going to change. Uh, you know, your utilities really aren't going to change by having one fewer person in the family, maybe, maybe a little bit, but not a whole lot. Those costs are mostly fixed. The big things that are going to change is the cost associated with a second vehicle. That's going to go away. Uh, maybe some grocery costs will go away. Um, but it's not going to be a huge amount. It doesn't mean we lose half the parents. That doesn't mean we can survive on half the cost. I think that's pretty clear. So you're actually going to put pencil to paper and try to figure this out and say, all right, well, if I earn 40000 a year um, and I pay uh, some taxes and some life insurance premiums and I assume a 10% cost of self-maintenance, I get done um, and I say that, all right, I need 26500 a year. Uh, that's what I would need in perpetuity or at least until retirement age uh, to replace my lost earnings. Well, at that point, you have a time value of money problem, 26500 for uh, if you start, if you were 40 years old when you did this calculation, you're planning on working until 65. All right, that's 25 years of 26,500. Pick a discount rate, um, and go ahead and punch in your numbers, and you can create um, a a value, an exact value, a precise value, right down to the penny. One of the problems with this approach is because it relies on numbers like that that people are overconfident in the results because it looks so precise. Um, but those calculations are only as good as the assumptions on which they're based, right? So if, if your tax calculation is wrong, your premium calculation is wrong, your cost of self-maintenance is wrong, uh, then your final number is going to be off too. So all we have to do once we've done all this is it's a present value of an annuity problem. We're not going to do that. I just want you to be familiar with the approach. Mathematically, that's just kind of challenging. Um, not because of the addition and subtraction of taxes and premiums and self-maintenance, but because time value of money problems generally can't be done on a four function calculator. Um, you're going to need a mathematical tool to help you process that, something that can handle future value and present value problems. Um, and mathematically, that's kind of complicated. So it's simple. I mean, you can do this in five minutes. It doesn't take very long. Um, we're not going to look at how much money you've saved and other sources of income that you've got because we're just counting on what are your current earnings and what would they have been over your lifetime. That's what's driving your life insurance need. That's it. How much money did you make? How much would you have made over the course of your life? we got to replace that. That's what we're trying to project, estimate, and then that's going to be how much we buy for life insurance. Um, earnings will not be constant in general, right? You get raises. You expect raises. Um, you expect promotions at some point. You're not going to go 25 years at the same salary. That would be extremely unusual. Um, family shares are changing. You know, um, children are growing up and leaving the family. New children could be coming into the family. Um, and that means that the family share of the provider's income could change. Anytime you estimate numbers and they rely on a long-term interest rate, small changes in that interest rate really dramatically impact the results. Hopefully, hopefully you've had a chance to do time value of money and problems, and you've seen if you're saving for retirement over 40 years, um, the difference between earning 6% on your investment 
and 4% on your investment is huge. That'll cut your returns in half. Um, and you wouldn't ordinarily expect that. But anytime you rely on a long-term interest rate, those kinds of results are possible. And then, yeah, we didn't do anything to talk about inflation. Okay, right now, that might be enough for your family to live on, that 26500 number we came up with. 20 years from now, that's not going to be enough. Even small amounts of inflation, again, small amounts of interest rate changes over long time periods uh, really add up. So we didn't do anything about inflation here. And that's trading off against that top idea where we were trying to get a simple estimate. Um, so one other approach we have is the needs approach. And this is going to be where we say that how much life insurance you need depends on the existence of certain needs out there. For example, are you trying to pay off a mortgage? Uh, do you want to make sure that your family would have no mortgage payment? Do you want to make sure that your family would be able to pay off other bills? To the extent those are out there, that's going to inflate the amount of life insurance you need. Um, so yeah, whatever bills you're trying to clear is part of the estate clearance fund. When I die, what debts do I want to be paid off? I have to have a certain amount of life insurance available to do that. Final expenses. Then I got to provide income to my family during a period of time when the children are growing up. Um, and that's a specific number dependent on how many years of income that we're talking about and how many children we're talking about. I probably want to provide income to my surviving spouse for life, um, not just through this dependency period when, I, when the children are uh, being raised, but beyond that when uh, I still would have been working and then possibly even beyond that when we would have been retired. Um, so a life income to the surviving spouse is something I want to provide. And then I mentioned, do you want to pay off the mortgage? Do you want to pre-fund your children's college education? That's going to be expensive. Um, an emergency fund, do you want to have some money set aside to be able to make some payments um, just for things that come up that you can't predict? All of these things influence how much life insurance you should buy. Um, and then whatever you'd need in retirement as well is something that should be considered. So the idea is, we sit down, we talk about this stuff, we think about it, we work it out, and then we're adding up all these things together. Mathematically, it's simple. It's just addition. We're just adding all these things up, and whatever exists has to be accumulated and accounted for. Um, so it's not a time value of money calculation so much. Um, so it, it doesn't take a long time to do this. It, it requires that you actually sit down and think about these needs, and that's a good thing. Um, you can see all kinds of uh, life insurance calculators that are out there that'll do this for you. Um, and that makes the process a little bit easier. The problem, of course, is you don't know how good of a calculator you're using. Um, so that's, that's one thing. You, you, it's worth talking to an agent before actually buying life insurance to make sure that what you're doing makes sense to a third party. Um, here we are going to consider other assets and sources of income. So we're going to say, well, how much money do you already have saved for retirement? Well, that reduces how much life insurance you are going to buy to support your family in retirement uh, because you've already got it. Um, so if you do have other sources of income, it makes sense to consider those here. The hard part about the needs approach is you're looking at this at a snapshot in time and needs can change. Um, and if they change dramatically enough, then however much life insurance you chose to buy five years ago might or might not be adequate today. If your health is good, you can always buy more. Um, if your health has changed, now you may have a problem. You may be locked into what you got. You can't buy anymore. Um, and we'll talk about a way around that particular problem later on when we talk about life insurance riders, things you can add to the contract. This is probably, yeah, this is a good place to stop. We'll pick up with other issues in life insurance in the next lecture. Thanks a lot.